if Labour wins the next election, the House of Lords could be scrapped and new powers transferred to the devolved nations and local communities. Some of the proposals, Sir Keir Starmer will call the biggest ever transfer of power from Westminster to the British people. And he joins us now live from Leeds. Very good morning to you, Sir Keir. Um, are you able to hear us? Um, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm missing the odd word. Um, apologies for that. Um, so, if that was a question, I missed it. Apologies. Oh, no, no. Uh, let me start with a question, uh, which is, if you want to abolish the House of Lords, how come you are still appointing peers? As in... <laughs> sorry, that might confuse um, people on this programme. Uh, <laughs> how come you are still appointing people to yeah. the House of Lords? Yeah, look, I'm... I just heard the end of that sen uh, uh, sentence, not the beginning of the question, but I think I've got the gist of it, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. And if I've got the wrong end of the stick, please um, stop me. But look, um, what we're saying um, in this report is there needs to be radical change, both politically and economically. And the driving force behind the report is a desire by me to make sure that we push power away from Westminster and Whitehall, um, closer to local communities, so that they get control over resource, decision-making, etc. This is particularly important economically because I think that one of the reasons that we have not got a strong economy is because we're not using all places across the United Kingdom. Now, any case for reform of the United Kingdom has to take on the question of the House of Lords. The House of Lords is pretty indefensible. It's very hard for anybody to say um, that they could defend it um, as it's currently set up, so we want to abolish it and replace it with an elected and smaller second chamber. Okay, That's just so one Starmer, of the I'm proposals. I'm going to interrupt you there because, yeah, as viewers will notice, very, very uh, we are also yeah. losing a few yeah. words from your answers, and the interview's too important for little bits of it to be uh, muted. Yeah. So, let's catch up on a weather forecast, and we will sort the gremlins with the Labour leader's interview. Right, we have defrosted the cables and we can go back to Sakir Starmer. I hope that um, we can communicate better now, Sakir. So, the question was... I can hear you now Mark, properly, so that's much better. That, that, that's a triumph. Um, the question was, if you want to <laughs> abolish the House of Lords, firstly, why are you still appointing new peers, including, controversially, Tom Watson, elevated to the House of Lords despite being yeah. uh, wrapped up mistakenly uh, with that, you know, what's now known as the witch hunt against VIPs. Uh, you've also nominated Francis O'Grady, of course. Um, why endorse it if you're going to abolish it? Well, the first thing to say is we do need to abolish it. I think the House of Lords is indefensible and we need an elected second chamber as part of a broad set of changes that we want for the whole of the United Kingdom. Obviously, um, at the moment, the House of Lords does a very important role in scrutinising legislation. I think everybody recognises that. We've got hard-working members of the House of Lords who do a really good job on scrutinising legislation. So, of course, we want the best people in there, um, unless and until there's change. But just, um, if I may put this in a broader context, because the thrust of the report that we're um, publishing this morning is about fundamental change, both economically and politically. And the most important part to me is devolving power, resource, decision-making away from Westminster and Whitehall closer to communities. I profoundly believe that those with skin in the game, those that live in their communities, know what's best. And we've had too many years of hoarding power in the centre in Westminster and Whitehall. And we need to put it closer to communities. And I think this is crucial in terms of growing the economy. We're going to... If we come into power, and I hope we, we do, we're going to inherit a broken economy and broken politics, and we need to fix that at speed. And the way to do that is to be brave enough to say those in Whitehall don't know best those who live in their communities are part of their communities with skin in the game. They've got a better idea of what's going to work in their community. So, so and we need I mean, to give them the opportunity to, to contribute uh, uh, to uh, growth. Yeah, so, so Kit, you'll know that uh, from the American elections and here that even though you've had a great by-election win, it's not enough not to be the Conservative. You've got to have a, a mission, a, a, a package for the nation yeah. that, that you can sell. And yeah. at the heart of it now, it appears to be uh, constitutional um, reform. And I hear that. But, no, um, no, no. No, what, no, what, no, just, no, no, that, that, that's absolutely wrong because this report is fundamentally answering the question, how do we grow our economy? 
And I think one of the reasons our economy hasn't grown is because we've not used the people across the, all of the United Kingdom. When I go to Burnley, Blackpool, Hull, you name it, Sunderland, Southampton, you've got communities there that are crying out for a government that's on their side, crying out for change. They want, they've got fantastic ideas about the businesses that could be set up and have already been set up. Ceramics in the Midlands, um, you know, but how creative is the media to that question, in Bristol and my, Bath, uh, so, sorry, video you... games in Dundee. How is the question to that, um, how's the answer to that question, um, m more politics? You know, you've got uh, nurses on strike, railway workers. Uh, as you yeah. um, rightly acknowledge, yeah. heading into the concrete crash mat of economic yeah. uh, catastrophe, yeah. um, you've got brilliant people um, in the House of Lords. Um, it, it's a time in our yeah. nation where there's never been a lower opinion of politicians, and yet you want an elected uh, second chamber, you want more locally elected politicians. What we know is what politicians do, they do no. expensively and poorly. No, 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 I don't want more elected um, local politicians. What I want to do is push decision making from the centre, from Whitehall, away and closer to communities. That is the opposite of more politicians. It, it, what's gone wrong in this country, in my view, um, and it goes to the... Why are we having a dispute, you know, whether it's rail or nurses, or why are people so worried about their bills? We're in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis. One of the major causes of that is that we have not... Um, grown our economy over the last 12 years. It's the single biggest failure. And we have to answer the question, how are we going to grow the economy? I fundamentally believe that we have to give the opportunity to people in their communities to have the chance to contribute towards that growth by having the power, the resources, decision over skills, education. Um, and I've seen for myself across so many parts of the United Kingdom the local ambition to get on and deliver, they just want a government that's prepared to be on their side, to share their ambition. So, yes, this answers the question of how do you grow the okay. economy of can the future. I, can the I fact ask that you we've about, got successful you, okay, um, examples sorry, around sorry, the country... Sorry, we haven't got long, but I, just, I want to ask you about a couple of yeah. things. Um, firstly, rail unions have rejected this 8% pay yeah. offer. Accepting it would have averted the strike, but uh, Mick Lynch said there was no question that they had to reject it. What should happen next? I want the government to get round the table and knock heads together and get this sorted. Nobody wants these what strikes. What should they offer Nobody them? wants the disruption no, going nobody into does. What should um, they offer Christmas. Them? And, uh, no, look, uh, look, I think the government has got to get round the table. I mean, the yeah, government has sat this one them? out. If you look at... The, would you just hear me out? Um, if you look at what's happened in Wales, the issue or similar issue in Wales has been resolved because the government got people around the table. So it is quite yeah, but it's not possible enough to get round the, the table. You have to get round the they... table with an offer. What's the offer? You don't just well, come to an agreement because you're in the same room. You know, both sides need to compromise. Both sides need to finish the negotiations, and the government needs to drive them forward. The government's been sitting on its hands in this. Um, that's not good enough, and I think if you look at the example of Wales, you can see that with a different approach, this could be resolved. So when is it time for trade union leaders, uh, when they've got that offer, to go directly to their members and ballot them and be democratic, Sakir? Well, when they think that they've got an offer that should be put to their members, and, you know, it's for the trade union to decide uh, amongst its members how they want to run their affairs, but I'm looking at the role of government, and I think what, what you've actually seen in the last... Um, few months is a government that just sits on its hands, that doesn't get involved. If you take the nurses dispute, we didn't have nurses strikes under the last Labour government. We had fair pay for nurses. We've got to have a government that's prepared to roll up its sleeves and get involved and resolve these issues. Okay, it's happening you, elsewhere. Okay, it you, could happen here. Do you back the nurses strike? Because out of all of the strikes, that might be the one that makes people most anxious. Yeah, and I completely understand, um, you know, the pressure down on nurses. As, as, uh, as, as I've said many times, my wife works in the NHS. This is a daily discussion um, for us. 
Uh, but do I want the strikes to go ahead? No, I don't. Do nurses want the strikes to go ahead? No, I don't, because of the um, implications of it. So what, again, I want to see the government that's do is to resolve these so, sorry, issues. Sorry, that's a politician's have... answer. No. And you just made well, a, a platform no, about isn't. people but... not wanting politicians. It's a simple question that Susanna's um, asked. Do you support them or not? How can uh, uh, this be funded? And what's the answer? It's not just a vision about devolving power locally or some virtue signal about having elected members of the House of Lords, despite there being brilliant people there that you acknowledge. It's about rethinking and reframing how we're going to be able to fund uh, the system moving forward, bearing in mind at the moment yeah. the market runs it. And well, do you think that's wise when it comes to things like water, when it comes to our nurses, when it comes to things that we well, know the market cannot produce an outcome for the people yeah. who Can, you me... need to vote for you? Well. Let, let me just take that head on, because one of the biggest problems in the NHS, and I know this firsthand, is we haven't got enough staff. We've had sticking plaster after sticking plaster. Nobody prepared to say we need a longer-term plan. So what we've said is, under a Labour government, we would have... We would double the number of medical staff being trained. That costs money, but we need to do it. The cavalry is coming, because if you don't have enough staff in the NHS, you will always have these pressures bearing down. And then when people say to me, well, Kia, how would you pay for that? I say we would get rid of the non-DOM status, uh, which allows the super wealthy to live here but not pay their taxes here. And so I would say nurses, not non-DOMs. That's a okay. choice that um, we would be prepared to make. OK, I want to just take you back to the House of Lords because new allegations in the Daily Mail this morning over Michelle Moan, member of the House of Lords. Um, she yeah. already faces questions over whether she benefited financially from the profits of a company providing PPE during the pandemic. And Matt Hancock has said that she used extraordinarily aggressive lobbying in support of a separate COVID contract. What questions do you think Michelle Moan must answer? I think the questions are obviously who had contact with who, what was said, what promises were made. It all looks as if it's unravelling. This isn't the only example either of, you know, what you might call crony contact. It's not the only example of fraud in the process. Obviously, I tread carefully here because this is an ongoing investigation, but there are clearly questions that now need to be answered, um, not just um, by those that benefited from the contracts, but also by the government as to how come some people found themselves in the VIP fast lane um, for these contracts. This is only one example of its type, I'm afraid. And I think most people, the public, would say, um, what on earth was going on in that period where um, some people were given this very, very fast access to very lucrative contracts? This isn't the only example. We need to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. So, Keir Starmer, yeah. thank you very thank you. much indeed for um, joining us this morning.